Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got into this situation. Well, it all started when... So basically, Cannes Film Festival offered this program for 18 to 28 year olds where if you write them a letter explaining why you love cinema and list the reasons you're just kind of a cool guy, then are lucky enough to get accepted. You were given the opportunity to attend the festival and watch as many of the movies as you'd like there for a whole three days. And when I first heard about this, I'm like, sign me the hell up, but figured it'd be a long shot. However, a month after I applied, I received an email saying I'd actually got a place and I was over the moon. I couldn't believe it. I was going to Cannes. I immediately booked my flight and my accommodation. A few more months passed and then suddenly it's... The morning of, I got myself some breakfast and then it was off to the airport. I had some time to kill before my plane, so I do a little exploring. I then head over to my gate, ready for my can adventure to officially commence. Now before I've even left the country, the craziness has already begun. Guess who sat directly behind me on the plane? None other than iconic British film director, Ken Loach. I subsequently spend the whole of my two hour flight building up the courage to say something to him, while simultaneously building the Lego space station shuttle I bought in G3. And then once we landed, I finally did. Me, him and his wife shared a whole conversation about the festival and it was just such an honour to get to meet him and something I'm never going to forget. I didn't ask for a picture because, you know, we're still on a plane and it would have just been awkward and weird, but this is an artistic representation of what our interaction looked like. And then I had finally made it. To Nice. So I then took a tram ride and a train until I had finally made it to King. First things first, I had to quickly drop off my stuff and my accommodation. A stressful half an hour walk with my phone on less than 10% and no idea where I'm going or what I'm doing. Before another stressful half an hour walk back to the festival area in order to pick up my accreditation badge. Just in the nick of time before 6 and my phone's still on basically no battery. I then spent the rest of my first evening in Cannes just roaming around the place and it was awesome. The whole city is so beautiful and the section populated by the festival is almost overwhelming with its spectacle. And the amount of onlookers and hot people dressed up in the fanciest things you've ever seen I took a stroll along the beach, I saw whatever this is, I watched some dudes do a couple flips. So sick. I then went to the official festival shop, caught myself a pin badge and a postcard before getting a Pokeball for dinner. At around 10, I decided to already start my half an hour walk back as I'd had a long day and knew I needed some sleep for tomorrow because I gotta be up at... <laughs> day 1 was an early start as your boy gotta get ready and then walk half an hour down to the bus stop that would take me up to the cinema I would spend most of my day at. The Cineum is this gigantic, crazy looking multiplex about a 20 minute journey away from the Palais. They showcase some of the films there in order to limit a lot of the traffic in the city centre. It's also a real cool place. I got myself one of these things for breakfast and then before I knew it, it was time for my first ever Cannes Film Festival movie. Club Zero by Jessica Hausner. Now Jessica Hausner's previous movie Little Joe intrigued me more than entertained but I thought I'd check out her new movie nonetheless. And now from what I've seen from her, she seems to be great at crafting films with pretty colours, awesome music, but the never really surpass a level in quality above fine or solid. However, I definitely enjoy this one much more, providing a bit more of a substantive experience. For those who don't know, the film chronicles a teacher who basically manipulates her entire class to develop eating disorders and then eventually stop eating altogether. An absolutely intriguing premise that does unfortunately end up feeling a little wasted. Mia Vesikovska's teacher character is definitely the main draw here, so when the story shifts in focus from her specifically during the latter half, it simultaneously becomes less interesting. The whole film needed much more of her manipulation and close examining blind faith, but instead, while engaging, it's just far too repetitive, with many of the other actors nowhere near as strong as they needed to be. However, the film has still kind of stuck with me, being genuinely unsettling and unnerving, and definitely far from an easy watch for some. But still, love the music, and I think I'll be checking out whatever Hausner does next, because I don't know, there's just something there that keeps pulling me back. Just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. Even if it is just kind of a lesser imitation of filmmakers I enjoy more, but I will. Two o'clock. Next up was a big one. Last train. Asteroid City was probably the film I was most excited about being able to see at the festival. I think Wes Anderson is such a cool guy, Fantastic Mr. Fox one of the greatest movies of all time, and I had lined up extra early to make sure I was sat directly in the centre of my row, just the way he would have wanted it. I was ready. And the film was pretty good. Asteroid City is much more reflective and quietly profound in tone than I was expecting. It starts out incredibly strong, but kind of loses a bit of its steam for me by the end of it, with many more incredible moments sprinkled in throughout. As always with Mr. Wesley, it looks absolutely beautiful, apart from literally one shot involving a green screen which sticks out like a sore thumb. 
Jason Schwartzman I thought gave a great performance, as do the whole supporting cast really, who are a lot of fun. I love it when new actors come in and perfectly fit into the worlds Wes creates. That was Henry Winkler and Benicio Del Toro for me in The French Dispatch, and now Maya Hawke and Rupert Friend here. And like, even when Tilda Swinton is on screen for less than 10 minutes, she still steals the show with just how incredible she is. Amazing production design, great little instances of stop motion, and like, it's Wes Anderson doing sci-fi, it's gonna be a little quirky. It's got all the inner workings of something I should absolutely adore, but felt it was just missing something that I can't quite put my finger on. But definitely check it out still, and I'm definitely going to be seeing this one again to hopefully like it even more. Because while it may not be a top tier Wes, it has had me thinking about it much more afterwards than some of his best. And anyway, a minor Wes still contains so much more soul, charm, and style than most of the things out there. Plus Adrian Brody Hart. Afterwards, I had just enough time to grab some food before a quick turnaround into A Brighter Tomorrow. I was able to see this at the Cineum IMAX, which is probably the biggest screen I've ever seen. It was awesome. But unfortunately, that might have actually been my favourite part of the movie, lol. I was admittedly not at all familiar with the work of Nanny Moretti prior to this, which might explain why I didn't really connect with it all that much. That and also some things possibly getting a little lost in translation, as the rest of the audience seemed to be loving it and were howling throughout. Whereas I, at a couple points in time, found myself accidentally chuckling at moments I later understood were attempting to be poignant. That being said though, it is still kind of funny, with the daughter's boyfriend reveal being an all-timer. But my biggest problem with the film is that it doesn't really seem to know what it wants to be about. Is it about communism? Is it about the current state of cinema? Relationship troubles? It all just felt a little bit muddled. However, it isn't boring, which is a movie's biggest crime. I was still entertained throughout, there are memorable scenes, just unfortunately not really for me. But do check it out if watching an eccentric Italian film director's ramblings for 90 minutes sparks your interest. Because you never know, you might love it. I then got the bus back into the city centre while wondering what I would get up to that evening. Turning my phone back on after the screening, I came to realise I had missed a bunch of tickets become available for the Cobweb premiere later that night. I was heartbroken, and to rub salt further into the wound, in order to conclusively check that all of them had gone, I'd had to cancel my Cobweb showing for the next morning, and then immediately all of those tickets became unavailable too. So at this point I'm just wandering around aimlessly with no plan whatsoever. But then, a miracle occurred. I kept on refreshing and refreshing the ticket page just on a whim, and suddenly... WE GOT ONE! I was overjoyed, you don't even understand! So I did the half an hour walk back to my room, well it was more of a run this time, to throw on my tuxedo, I got an uber back to the festival area, as my feet freaking hurt in these freaking shoes, and got ready to queue up for the red carpet. That's right, my ticket for the premiere meant not only could I walk on the red carpet, but also up the famous Palais de Festival stairs. I got my picture taken, I was waving at the crowds, it was awesome. And as I began to ascend them, I became oddly emotional. The whole thing just felt like a dream. Then when inside the Grand Theatre Lumiere, we saw the cast and crew on the red carpet before they entered, and then I got to watch the film in the same room as Song Gang Ho. And the film itself might just be my favourite of the festival. I absolutely adore South Korean cinema, so it was no surprise that I was totally hooked with this one right from the opening shot. But what did surprise me, however, is that Cobweb is a straight-up comedy. Once again, I was admittedly not very familiar with this particular Korean director, Kim Ji-woon, at the time, but this has gotten me even more excited to check out the rest of his filmography. The film is a completely chaotic romp, and some of the most fun I've had with a movie in a while. Song Kang-ho is awesome as usual, but the whole cast here are memorable. Ji-woon has stylistic flair for days, and the movie looks absolutely stunning. It could have probably done with cutting down around 15 to 20 minutes, but I was still very much entertained throughout. Definitely check this one out when it becomes available to you. A fantastic example of greatly elevating a standard premise into an unbelievably wild ride. After the film ended, no surprise, there was a standing ovation. And once again, I got a little emotional because, you know, I've been watching these absurdly overlong standing ovations with the cameraman so uncomfortably close to the cast and crew's faces for years now. And never could I expect to be ever actually taking part in one. I then finished the evening with my half an hour walk home once again, this time without shoes on because my feet absolutely killed, arriving back around 2am and getting to sleep right away in an attempt to be ready for... <laughs> Running on 5 hours sleep and no breakfast, I had the ideal movie lined up first thing. A slow French period drama romance about the culinary arts. But totally unexpected to me, I kinda loved it. The Pot au Faux is an absolutely gorgeous looking movie. The lighting and the colour palette are just so rich, it's incredibly easy to become totally absorbed in it and obsessed, especially during the sequences where they're preparing food. But as well as this, it's also all incredibly romantic, thanks to both Juliette Binoche and Benoit Magimel's captivating performances with beautiful chemistry. 
It's mostly a subdued movie with close to no music, the sounds of the utensils and fire crackling helping define the tone and atmosphere. Slightly undermined by the fact I could hear the Club Zero score echoing from the screening in the next room. Cam Pro tip. The arcades are not the best place to watch the movies, but if you have to, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Minor complaints are just some slightly abrupt editing for me on a couple of occasions, and I could easily see how a lot of people may find this movie boring, like, I was kind of expecting to, not gonna lie. I mean, it is pretty slow. But overall, I thought it was pretty awesome. Great ending also, and now I'm intrigued to check out all of Tran An Hung's previous work. Afterwards, I raced out quickly to finally grab myself some food, stopping at this real nice bagel place that I'd recommend, and then had another bit of a gap until my next movie. So I went back to the official can shop to pick myself up a tote bag and also nab a couple pics, before heading over to this fancy theater, The Quasette, for another one of my most anticipated movies, Michel Gondry's The Book of Solutions. Now with Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind being one of my absolute all-time favorite movies, my expectations may have been a little too high, as Gondry's other films have never really seemed to hit those same heights. The Book of Solutions another solid example of this. However, solid being the key word there, as I still did like it. The film is very amusing, very playful, with Pierre Nene's central performance my absolute favorite thing about it. He is truly pitch perfect in his portrayal of a director, I'm sure somewhat representative of Gondry himself. We can see Gondry's signature whimsical style of filmmaking in scattered instances here, but I just kept craving more of that, especially once we move into the third act and the film becomes a little more conventional and formulaic in terms of the main character's arc, if he even really has one. But I don't regret watching it, just nothing really that stand out apart from Nene's excellent performance and a great final shot. Now the film was scheduled to finish around 4 o'clock, but was a little late starting so wrapped up around 10 past. This then allowed me just 10 minutes to run back over to the palais with a 2 minute toilet break and bow tie putting on stint in between, in order to start queuing up in the last minute queue for the Old Oak premiere. Now the last minute queue is basically for badge holders without a ticket, where, once everybody with a ticket has been let into the theatre, a select handful at the front of the queue are permitted to enter as well, in order to fill up any of the few remaining seats. And it's a tricky situation because obviously no one wants to be queuing up for 10 hours in the sun, wasting time that could be spent on watching more movies. But if you ain't queued up for at least like 2 hours, maybe even 3 before the movie starts depending on its popularity, you ain't ever getting in mate. I heard some people lined up at like 1 in the morning for the new Scorsese, and bear in mind, his premiere was at 4 in the afternoon. But once again, after just 5 minutes of standing there, a miracle occurred. I decided to try my luck once again at refreshing the ticket page, and as if it was written in the stars, a ticket appeared. So your boy got to leave the queue, and instead go and try out some French McDonald's. After a tasty burger and some Lipton iced tea, it was time once more to enter the Lumiere. This time to watch my best mate's new movie in the same room as him even if I was on the complete opposite side and literally another floor. But happy to report that Old Oak is real good. My favorite thing about Ken Loach's movies is just how they feel so real. He excels at capturing genuine struggle and authentic human emotion, tackling topics with sincerity and with purpose. The Old Oak consists of well-drawn characters, impeccable acting all round, and I don't have much to say other than it's just another certified Ken Loach classic. It's not particularly groundbreaking, and this specific film may be a little too simplistic and predictable for me, but I'd be damned to say if it isn't still deeply beautiful and moving. So check it out, because if reports are correct, it may be his last movie. Also, check out Sorry We Missed You, my favourite Ken Loach as of yet, and one I feel went under a lot of people's radar. So then if the ending didn't have me tearing up, Ken Loach's speech post-movie sure as hell did. Genuinely one of the most moving and powerful things I've ever had the honour of experiencing in person. Something that just makes you want to become a better person, you know? And once more, something that I'm not going to forget anytime soon. Damn, Ken Loach really just be out here truly impacting my life left, right and centre. Respect. Another early start and a half an hour walk down to the Debussy Theatre for an 8.30 showing of the new Vim Wenders movie, Perfect Days. It was a very nice theatre and a very nice movie too. The whole film just looks great, it's really pretty, and I loved how the curtains in the cinema were drawn perfectly to fit the film's aspect ratio. That was kinda neat. Perfect Days follows a toilet cleaner in Tokyo, just going about his day-to-day -day life, listening to his tunes, and we gradually learn more about him through some unexpected encounters. Koji Yakusho took away the Best Actor award at Cannes for this, and I think that was very much deserved. Really beautiful performance, and it speaks to his greatness that it was actually much more taken by the film in its first half, where we're simply following him around, observing these small interactions in his character's life. Not saying the latter half is bad at all, where the film's message is conveyed much more through these greater connections he makes. The first half just provided a more compelling experience for me personally. But striking movie nonetheless. I especially loved the ending, and Japanese toilets probably the coolest thing I've ever seen. Then as soon as I left the theatre, I then went straight back in again, for the now Palm Door winning film Anatomy of a Fool. There was a lot of buzz surrounding this one even before it took away the top prize, and while I don't think I love it as much as a lot of other people do, I still thought it was very good. 
The film's screenplay and performances are definitely the most standout aspects for me. Sandra Hula rules, and Milo Machadograna gives an exceptional child performance. The drama of it all is genuinely gripping and intriguing, which is why I found the few instances of attempted comedy to be rather misplaced. Comically cutting to the judge going, Okay. Causing many of the audience to crack up after just hearing a recording of domestic violence was an interesting choice. Small things like this just took away from the real gut punch of it all. But overall, really good courtroom drama that may be slightly overstuffed, but I like to see again in case my opinion differs second time around. After two movies in a row, I decided to head back to that bagel place and just chill out for a little while. But I did get a chance to actually look around the palais itself. Not sure if I was meant to or allowed to, but it was pretty cool. And this was all before my final film of the festival and another one I was extremely excited for, Jonathan Glazer's The Zone of Interest. Now, I have something very embarrassing to admit. At this point during my time at Cannes, I was very much exhausted. I hadn't realized just how much 10 movies in three days could take it out of you. Therefore, I may have accidentally drifted off a little tiny little minuscule amount during the movie. I know, I know, I'm so sorry. But I still watched quite a bit of it, and from what I could take in, it is as great as everyone is saying it is. So obviously, I was completely not in the right mindset to fully appreciate this and now to comment on it. I will definitely be seeing it again, or I guess kind of for the first time, lol. But we'll just say, from what I've seen, it is superbly well directed and its depiction of evil completely chilling and effective. And Mika Levy's music, impeccable as always. So at this point, I am deeply ashamed of myself and also extremely tired, so I just sit down for like 20 minutes to try and figure out how I want to spend my evening. I really want to sleep, but I know that this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so pick myself up an ice cream and watch some of the red carpet for the closing ceremony. I attempt on a whim to refresh once more and nab myself some last-minute tickets to the festival's closing film, Elemental, but I guess my luck had run out as that was a no-go. But I wasn't really too fussed as it comes out pretty soon anyway and doesn't even really look that interesting to me. And what I really wanted to do was sleep. And that's just what I did. After you guessed it, another half an hour walk back. Sunday was my final day in Cannes. The festival had finished, so I spent the rest of my time there exploring around more of the town. I got myself some breakfast from a creperie, which I would show you, but somebody ate it, and then went clambering up towards the massive Cannes sign. There was an amazing view up there, and simply walking around a few of the streets some more cemented just how beautiful this place really is. I then admired all of the yachts, got a sneak peek at Doom Part 2, and eventually walked past the Palais for the final time, bidding it a fond au revoir. I want to acknowledge how incredibly privileged and fortunate I am to have been able to have had this experience, and attending the Cannes Film Festival was, no word of a lie, probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. I am eternally grateful. I gained the utmost confidence, I met a ton of cool new interesting people, and engaged in so much exciting cinema that has opened my peripheral even more. It felt like falling in love with this art form all over again. So therefore, if you ever get the chance, and you're not put off by queuing up sometimes for hours, your phone almost always about to die, people laughing at your French accent, risking your life every time you cross the street, drowning in your own sweat in the French sun, wanting to sleep any small chance you get, and then walking, walking, and more walking until your feet feel like they're gonna fall off. You should do it, and I promise you, you won't regret it. And I guess there's only one thing left to say. Wait, hold on. Skadoosh. So let's have hope, because we know at base, we're good neighbors. We help each other when they're down. We welcome them in, and we can make an, a better place. Another world is possible. So keep fighting, and if we fight hard, we'll win. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.